Don Quixote, an epic of satire by Miguel de Cervantes, was written in two parts, published in 1605 and 1615. The narrator, who's fictional, claims to be telling the true story of Don Quixote. In part one, Alonzo Quijano, nearing 50, has an obsession with chivalric romance stories and takes on the persona of a knight errant named Don Quixote, the central character and titular protagonist of the book. While the degree of his insanity is debatable, he's very intelligent and a master orator on a variety of subjects. Armed with shabby armor and a homemade helmet, he and his elderly horse, Rocinante, set off for adventure in the Spanish countryside. He dedicates his career as a knight to a local woman he refers to as Dulcinea del Toboso, despite the fact that he's never actually spoken to her. She's still one of the book's central characters. She's actually a peasant from Toboso who caught Don Quixote's eye years ago, and he turns her into a mythical woman of great beauty and virtue. Though she's often referenced, spoiler alert, she never actually appears in the book. Her lack of a physical appearance in the novel does not diminish her importance, though. She's Quixote's symbol of a perfect woman. The truth of her life is replaced with Quixote's vision of her. Don Quixote stays in an inn he believes is a castle. Then he returns home to gather supplies and acquire a squire, Sancho Panza, a local peasant farmer and one of the novel's central characters. He becomes Don Quixote's loyal squire and dreams of governing an island and enjoying all of the perks that go along with public office. Greedy, yet loyal to a fault, Sancho at first doesn't realize that his master might be insane. As their journey continues, Sancho Panza, a realist, starts taking on some of Don Quixote's idealistic qualities, particularly where promises of wealth and fame are concerned. He's always accompanied by his prized possession, his donkey. He's not the brightest guy in town and manages to overlook nearly every odd thing Don Quixote does, including mistaking windmills for giants. Both men travel on one of the key symbols in the book, animals and transportation, namely their horse and donkey, respectively. In Don Quixote, one indicator of a person's status is the animal he or she uses for transportation. Donkeys are for the lower class. Horses are for the middle and upper classes. Sancho Panza rides a donkey. Don Quixote rides his horse, Rocinante. People who don't use animals for transportation are either very poor and travel on foot, or very wealthy and travel in a carriage. The relationship between the donkey and Rocinante symbolizes the relationship between Sancho and Don Quixote. The animals look different, serve different purposes, and have different temperaments, but they're best friends through thick and thin. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza meet a number of interesting people on their journey, battle unsuspecting foes, and startle nearly everyone with the knight errant's obvious insanity. The Don, in one quest, seeks one of the book's key symbols, Mambrino's helmet. The brass basin Don Quixote takes from the nameless barber symbolizes Don Quixote's idealism and insanity. Everyone else sees a bowl used for shaving and bloodletting, but Don Quixote sees the magical helmet of a legendary knight. The barber's brass basin is a reminder of how different Don Quixote is from everyone around him. Don Quixote aids a group of escaped prisoners headed to the galleys. He and Sancho Panza hide from the police in the mountains where they meet a crazed young man named Cardinio, whose introduction sets off a chain of new characters with stories of star-crossed lovers. Don Quixote decides the best way to show his love for Dulcinea is to perform acts of madness. He sends Sancho Panza to Toboso with a message for Dulcinea, but he's intercepted by Pero Perez and Master Nicholas, a priest and barber surgeon from Don Quixote's hometown. Pero Perez in particular, a local priest, is one of the book's central characters. He's been friends with Alonso Quijano for years, and his friend's decision to become a knight errant comes as somewhat of a shock. He blames the chivalric romances Don Quixote so enjoys reading, and he, along with Master Nicholas, oversee their burning. Pero Perez is a realist who dislikes these type of stories because they gloss over the realities of day-to-day -day life and glorify impossible achievements. Worried about their friend, they devise a scheme to bring Don Quixote home and cure him of his madness, which involves a fake princess, an imaginary giant, and several stories within the story about honor, virtue, and love. Don Quixote is finally delivered to his home via ox cart. It's worth noting here that much of the action in part one of Don Quixote takes place at inns, one of the key symbols in the book. As structures, the inns mentioned in the book represent Don Quixote's state of mind. In part one, he thinks all inns are castles and the people within are knights, kings, and princesses. As his journey comes to an end in part two, he starts recognizing the inns for what they really are. Inns are also symbolic because of the people found within. 
Each inn is a microcosm that mirrors society at large. As the customer base changes, so does the inn's purpose. Cervantes uses inns to explore the interactions among different factions of Spanish society. Part two of the novel begins after a month of rest. Don Quixote again desires to right the wrongs of the world, and he and Sancho Panza pack their saddlebags for another adventure. They begin in Toboso, where Sancho Panza fools Don Quixote into thinking a random peasant girl is his beloved Dulcinea del Toboso under enchantment. Now on a quest to free his lady love, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza meet a rival knight, the Knight of Mirrors, mm. who says that he has already vanquished Don Quixote. They agree to a duel, and Don Quixote wins! The Knight of Mirrors turns out to be Samson Carrasco, a college graduate who had previously told Don Quixote and Sancho Panza about the publication of their misadventures by a Moorish author. Samson Carrasco has been working with Pero Perez and Master Nicholas to bring Don Quixote home again, but here, his plan failed. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza learn more about love at a wedding and then take a trip to Montesino's cave. While in the cave, Don Quixote has visions of Montesinos and other famous knights, as well as his Dulcinea. Master and Squire run into a duke and duchess mm -hmm. who are completely enamored with the published stories about the lunatic knight. They invite Sancho Panza and Don Quixote to their castle, where they play endless, bizarre, mean-spirited pranks on the trusting Squire and his crazy master. The duke promises Sancho Panza a governorship, and he is soon sent to an island where it turns out he's actually a very just and wise ruler. It's not mm. actually an island, though. Don Quixote soon grows weary of the idle life in the castle. When Sancho Panza gives up his position after just 10 days, the pair ends up in Barcelona, where the Knight of the White Moon challenges Don Quixote. If Don Quixote wins, he can kill the other knight. If he loses, he must retire from knight errantry for a year. He's beaten soundly, and the other knight turns out to be Samson Carrasco once more. Along the way home, Don Quixote decides that he should become a shepherd and adopt the lifestyle found in pastoral romances. They're almost home when they hear about a second text written about their exploits, but this particular book wasn't written by the original author. They find fault with nearly everything written and declare it untrue. Don Quixote falls ill once they're back at home. He vehemently renounces knight errantry and chivalric romance stories, mourning the good, wholesome books he never got a chance to read. He abandons <coughs> the name Don Quixote and goes back to being Alonzo Quijano once more. Hmm. Don Quixote dies the next day. Though written in the early 17th century, Don Quixote covers a variety of themes still applicable today. Some of the themes are used to point out how harmful, fanciful stories about chivalric knights can be, and others are a commentary on society at large. Idealism versus realism is a theme that speaks directly to the Don. He constructs a moral code built around unrealistic expectations and outdated beliefs. Then he fully immerses himself in a fantasy world that soon becomes his reality. He turns a regular peasant woman into a virtuous, beautiful maiden worthy of being a knight's lady love, and he sees castles in the frameworks of humble country inns. When things don't turn out as expected, he blames it on unseen magicians and their enchantments. Don Quixote's idealistic nature keeps him happy, even when situations are less than desirable. Sancho Panza is a realist by nature who sees things as they are, not the way they should be, unlike his master. The theme of honor and virtue goes hand in hand in Don Quixote. The best men are honorable. The most desirable women are virtuous. In 17th century Spain, it wasn't just who you were, but how you acted that determined your value. Chivalric romance stories are the ultimate example of honor and virtue, which is why Don Quixote has dedicated himself to the protection of both. A woman's virtue encompassed her modesty and her chastity, which comes up many times. But the men in Don Quixote are subject to a different set of social standards, namely those relating to honor, which defines who they are in the eyes of the community at large. Honor, it seems, is even more important than a person's morals. Love is a common theme in Don Quixote, particularly how it relates to marriage. In the various stories told throughout part one, love is presented as immediate and all-encompassing and as an excuse for bad behavior. Cervantes blames this perversion of what it means to be in love on the idea that chivalric romances were accepted as fact. Cervantes, in general, really isn't impressed with romance. 
Insanity is another key theme, underscoring a key question. Is Don Quixote actually insane? Cervantes explores this question throughout the book without ever coming to a formal conclusion. Insanity, it appears, is in the eye of the beholder. While most people find Don Quixote's dedication to knight errantry a symptom of madness, Sancho Panza initially takes it as a matter of fact. Don Quixote is higher born than Sancho is. He's educated and he speaks eloquently. Yet Don Quixote comes across as absolutely insane by dozens of other characters in the book, ranting about the veracity of chivalric tales and boasting about his own strength and bravery. Cervantes also raises questions of insanity with regard to other characters in the book. What do people mean when they say someone is insane? For some characters in the book, insanity means both mental and physical change in personality. For others, insanity is the exhibition of different lifestyles or different sets of beliefs. Readers of Don Quixote, like the characters within, must answer these questions for themselves. Finally, Don Quixote is, among other things, a commentary on the theme of class in 17th century Spain. The upper class is depicted as idle, lazy, and not altogether nice, as evidenced by the Duke and the Duchess. They view those socially beneath them as nothing more than playthings for their amusement. Sancho Panza is on the other end of the class scale. In general, peasants and the middle class come across as much kinder and more giving than the upper class, which actually has the means to help others. The publication of Don Quixote ultimately yielded some financial and social benefits for Cervantes. And interestingly, in the decade between the publication between part one and part two, an unauthorized sequel to Don Quixote came out that Cervantes hated and criticized mercilessly all throughout part two of his own book. Cervantes' Don Quixote is thought to be the first bestseller in literary history, and over 400 years later, the novel's themes and plethora of laughs are as enjoyable as ever. <laughs>